Okay, so I'm just about to head off to Birmingham for the photography show, along with my new hoodie. But I wanted to share this video with you going through something I've been experimenting with lately. A filter in Photoshop that is normally used on landscapes, but when you use it on portraits, adds a totally unique look. I absolutely love it. So the filter I'm talking about is Depth Blur, and you'll find that within the neural filters in Photoshop. And the technique I've been experimenting with, I did recently on a portrait I took of a great guy called Trigger. And because of the blur in the foreground and the background that the filter creates, it gives the look that he's almost coming forward of the screen. And as this reply when I first shared the image online says, it seems to bring it to life. But before I show the technique I've been experimenting with, let's dive into Photoshop, look at the depth blur filter so you can see where it is and what all of the settings do. Okay, so here's a landscape scene then to use as an example. I'll duplicate the background layer by holding down the Command key on Mac or Control key on PC and pressing J. Then we'll go to Filter and Neural Filter. Depth Blue is here on the right hand side at the bottom, so it's still a beta, so it's not 100% finished, but you can use it. If you see a cloud icon next to it like this, then just click on that to download and install it. Now I have it downloaded, so each time I want to use it, I just slide this button across to turn it on. When I do, the filter doesn't know what I want to be in focus and what I want to be out of focus. But we can see that we have blur in the foreground and blur in the background, and this little white building here is in focus. We can control the depth of field and what is in focus using settings over on the right hand side. First of all, we have the focal distance slider. Think of this as the focus point, where you are placing those focus points if you're using your camera, what you want to be the main in focus part of the picture. If I drag this to the far left, then give Photoshop time to process it, we can see the result. The far left is telling Photoshop to make those closest parts of the picture to us in focus, which we can see here with the sharpness of the foliage and then how it begins to go out of focus. If I drag the focus distance slider to the right, and then give Photoshop time to process it. This is telling Photoshop to make everything that's furthest away to be in focus. We can see that with the distant clouds being in focus, but everything else leading up to it out of focus. So for now, I'll place the focus distance about a third of the way along so that the white building is in focus. Next, we have focal range. Think of this as the lens aperture. If I place it to the far left, then that is the equivalent of a wide open aperture. But if I drag it to the far right, that is like having a much narrower aperture. So much more of the picture will be in focus despite where I place the focus distance or the focus area. Now I like the effect the wide open aperture gives by blurring the foreground and the background. So I'm going to drag the marker all the way to the left. We can also put our cursor inside this smaller preview area here on the right hand side and click down on an area that we want to be the focus point. When we do that, we can see that the focal distance slider is now greyed out, so doing this is like going into manual focus on your camera. We can still use the focus range slider, so in effect we can change the aperture to have more or less of the scene in focus in relation to where our focus point is. We can click and drag on this focus point to change what is the main subject, and we can also delete it by just clicking here. Then we have this focus subject checkbox. This is telling Photoshop to use its Select Subject technology to analyze the picture and pick out the main subject matter. When I do that, you can see that Photoshop recognizes the white building as being the main subject. Now it's locked on, I can then use the Focal Range slider to control how much or how little I want in the picture to also be in focus. But for this picture, using the manual focus point by clicking in the preview works best. Moving down, we have the blur strength, which controls how much blur we want in those out of focus areas. To the left is less, to the right is more. And at the bottom, we can choose how we want to send the image back to Photoshop, such as a new layer, a smart filter, a new document, and so on. Now, there are more controls, like being able to add haze into the background and also change the color and add grain. But now we've had a run through the sliders, let me show you this on a portrait.
Okay, so here we have a partially retouched picture of my friend Trigger. Over in the layers panel, I'll create a copy of this by holding down the command key on Mac or control key on Windows and pressing J. And then we'll go to the filter menu and choose neural filters. Then I'll come over to the right hand side and turn on depth blur. Now in the settings here, it's automatically gone to focus subject. I'll leave that ticked so that Photoshop can use its select subject technology to make a selection of trigger as being the main subject. I'll keep the focal range down to the far left and the blur strength I'm going to take up on this time round all the way up to 100. Once it's finished processing, I'll then come down to the output and I will choose smart filter and then click OK. Now once back in Photoshop, one thing I am going to do is just very quickly look at the original selection it made of Trigger to make sure that everything's okay. And we can see here it's a little bit rough and we're missing his ear. So what I will do is lower the opacity of the upper layer and then click on the layer mask for the smart filter. I'll zoom in, I'll get a brush with a black foreground colour and just paint over these areas to bring them back. So I'll just paint down the side of his face. I'll hold the space bar down and just go round the hairline as well to make sure that's looking good. And let's just check around the rest of the outline of Trigger to make sure that no other areas have been missed and have been blurred and we don't really want them to. So like a little bit on his jeans just there, maybe just there as well. Again, using that space bar, clicking and dragging just to check around the actual outline of Trigger. And let's go around here. And just checking on the jeans, everything's looking good there. Okay, that select subject technology is very, very good. So now that we've got that, I'm going to click back on the thumbnail of the uppermost layer, then go and reapply the depth blur filter again. I'll go to the filter menu. I could then do the shortcut here to reapply it, but I'll take it the long way around so that you can see exactly what I'm doing. I'll go to neural filters, come back over to the right hand side turn on depth blur and I'll use exactly the same settings. We'll use focus subject, focal range to the far left and I'll take the blur strength all the way over to the right hand side to 100. Then I'll come down to the output and choose smart filter and then click OK. Now that we're back in Photoshop you might find that the amount of blur that you've added now with two neural filters is more than enough. However, I want to add just a little bit more on this picture of trigger. But what I found is if I try to add more than two depth blur neural filters, Photoshop does tend to struggle just a little bit, even though my computer is really powerful. So what I'm going to do is create a merged or stamp layer to the top of the layer stack. And I'll do that by holding down the Shift, Option, Command and E keys on Mac or the Shift, Alt, Control and E keys on Windows. Then I'll go to the filter menu and choose neural filters. I'll come back over to the right hand side turn on depth blur, we'll keep the focal range to the far left, we'll use the focus subject checkbox, but the blur strength I'm actually going to leave at the default of 50, so slightly less on this third time round. I'll then come down to the output and choose smart filter and click OK. So now that we're back in Photoshop, let's turn this all off and on. So I'll come down to the background layer, hold down the Option key on Mac or Alt key on Windows and click just underneath the eye icon. That turns every layer off apart from this one. So we can go before and after, before and after. I really hope that is showing up on your screen because I love this effect. And here is the final retouch picture. I just love how this almost makes the subject look as if they're coming forward of the picture. It's almost as if you could reach forward and touch them. Of course, you don't need to use the exact same settings as me. You could use more or you could use less. That's down to you. But have a play and let me know in the comments how you get on. Oh, and there's one more thing in depth blur that I didn't mention, and that's this depth map checkbox here. And this is what you get when you choose it. I'll do another video soon showing why you would use that and what you can do with it, because it is incredible when it comes to adding effects into your pictures. Right, I've got to get packing, so I will leave you with the usual. And that's just to say that if you've enjoyed the video, please do give us a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, click on that subscribe button because that is just a great free way that you can support the growth of this channel. But for now, that's me. I'm done. I will see you in the next video. Oh, and one last thing. It's not long now until the Lightroom Virtual Summit 2022. You can grab your free pass using the link in the description and in the comments.